So hello to everybody. Uh, I would like to uh, present uh, you some ideas about European identity and uh, the question mark uh, in my speech is if does it, does it need a common language. Uh, so let's start with the question or with the sentence uh, which was like inspired by uh, Italian sentence uh, made 150 years ago and now maybe we can switch to the higher level uh, the same sentence. So we already made, uh, we have made Europe and now we must make Europeans. Uh, so how to make it? It's a big question mark uh, in this uh, area because it's profoundly or deeply linked with language in, in my opinion. Uh, because language is only a part of one's identity uh, expression but a very important one for uh, now we can see it everywhere in Europe. Uh, the, the, the movements in uh, a lot of countries, the rise of, of nationalism and so on. Uh, and this could be a, maybe a negative uh, or could have a negative uh, of consequences for, for the future, not only for several states, but also for Europe as a whole. Uh, so what create, uh, creates our feeling of being Slovak, British, uh, Russian, etc. Et uh, big part of this, our identity and nationality is deeply linked to, to our mother uh, tongue or tongues and with the languages of the country we live in. And from this uh, point of view, it is important to, to realize or to, to be aware that language uh, has a, uh, let's say it's a multi-level tool, so it has uh, several aims or several fun functions. Uh, so the first one, maybe one of the most important, uh, is the, the communication function. Uh, so the, the first idea is to communicate something to, to the others, uh, to deliver the information, uh, to pass some information or express your thoughts, emotions and so on. Uh, then, very important is, of course, understanding. So, you have to pass the information in the correct language. So, if I would speak to you some very important issue, but in the language you don't understand, the, like the, the, the understanding will not function, and doesn't work, uh, and then like the, the language uh, loses its, uh, 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 its meaning, and this is also the the sentence I like, uh, the importance, uh, uh, important uh, thing about the communication, that what the language has in a name, as a name, many languages destroy. Uh, this is maybe not so easy to understand uh, by the uh, polyglot uh, community, but it's uh, the very important issue uh, in this uh, level of understanding in languages uh, or in language. Uh, so we have to speak uh, the same language to, to understand each other. And then the third and maybe uh, most underestimate uh, one is the identification. So the identity uh, with some, some group is very deeply linked with language. We can see it now in Europe, in, in many countries, and language is a tool of identity. Uh, we can see it almost everywhere. And then the big question mark, so what about the European identity? Uh, it is possible without language? If yes, how? Uh, do we need European identity or, or not? Uh, so the language is a, uh, is a medium for spreading ideas. But on the other hand, because of its form, it is also a sign of belonging to a group. Uh, therefore, language is a crucial part of group identity. And this is maybe a, one of the most important issues and one of the problems nowadays in Europe, at least in my opinion, that we as a, let's say, as a European Union or as a Europe, has some, some lack, lack of understanding, lack of discussions, and lack of maybe common identity. Uh, and language is not only meant for communication, and uh, this is maybe a big 
problem in, in some levels of policy, for example, that uh, we think that only to speak, I don't know, the language of, of, the, of, the, of the biggest or of the, of the empire uh, will solve everything. Uh, the problem is that the people, like the ordinary uh, inhabitants in the uh, uh, majority of the countries, at least in Europe, uh, would not accept this. Uh, and it, it, it is so actually already now. Uh, there is, I don't know how, how long it is, Slovakia is already in, in Europe. And you will find everywhere people, they will not uh, be possible to, to communicate in English on, or, or in, in, in uh, actually any foreign language. Uh, and uh, so the, the, this uh, society, it's a differentiation marker. Uh, language, uh, it signals our membership to a certain group. And that's the point I think English wouldn't uh, work so well as a communication tool or like identity uh, language of European Union. Also because of the, uh, of, of the uh, last uh, events, let's say, or decisions in, in, in Great Britain uh, last year. Uh, so, how to express our European identity? Can we create Europeans without a common language? What do you think? We will have a discussion after. So, I'm really interested about your opinions about this topic. Uh, in my opinion, it is not so easy to create the feeling of Europeanism or to feel something to, with the people of, of other nations. Uh, without the possibility to speak with these people. Uh, and this domination of the English, there is a big uh, ask or the big, big question mark if the English language is the best solution for, for the European Union in the future or even now, in these days. Uh, then next questions. Could communication among Europeans be more efficient and easier than it is now? Uh, if you know about the results of the Eurobarometer, the, the, question, uh, the questions each seven years, there is a, a big uh, uh, there are just questions about the languages and language knowledge in, in all European uh, countries. Uh, there are several, maybe, maybe 20 uh, questions and uh, each country has a thousand response, so it's 24,000 uh, uh, people, they will respond these questions. And all these questions was worse after the seven years than before, about the language knowledge. Though. So it's maybe strange, but uh, after seven years of uh, progress, of the teaching, of, of uh, language lessons, of uh, a lot of time, a lot of money invested in language uh, learning. We have, uh, we have uh, the, the results are more or worse than uh, uh, or worse than before. So there is a another question: if we need a brand new language for, uh, because of that, or, or for, for the communication of in, in Europe, uh, and then. Uh, even much important, if we want European Union, like unity of European Union, uh, if we want Union to be closer, uh, if we want to uh, to speak uh, one with the other, uh, with the other, or if we just want to make the borders again, as it's like modern in, in uh, these days with a lot of countries, a lot of. Uh, uh, populism and a lot of politicians, they just used uh, the, the uh, opinions of some people and uh, c like would like maybe to create new borders between us. Uh, and what about the question if we need a brand new Europe uh, or even brand new world? If we need a new system based on sharing instead of owing, uh, if we need maybe source-based economy, free knowledge, uh, the, the ideas of uh, uh, unity uh, and uh, like a little bit other, uh, let's say, um, 
values as, as we have now uh, as a um, empire, let's say. Uh, what about languages in European Union after Brexit? So now, in the times of Brexit, should we speak more about these uh, ideas? Should we speak uh, about the languages which are uh, uh, teached or learned in our countries? Uh, what about English after Brexit, for example? Uh, which languages should we uh, use uh, in the future? Uh, one nice example was, for example, Greece. With the economic crisis of Greece, there was thousands of highly educated people, like uh, doctors and so on, uh, which was they, they were ready to, to go somewhere in the Europe or in the world, uh, to travel there, to live there, uh, to make, uh, make their professions. But the biggest, biggest problem was actually the, the, the language. Uh, the biggest, let's say, employee in Europe uh, ready to accept new people was Germany, but in Greece you learn maybe 99% only English as a foreign language. So these people had no chance to go to, to Germany to work there as a, as a, as a doctor uh, without the German uh, language knowledges. Uh, and to speak German on high level to, to be able to, to be a doctor, it takes time, and, and they had no time after the crisis uh, uh, start. So the language policy in the European Union is really interesting that it's like really neglected, ne neglected issue, and uh, it actually is very important because we all need to communicate, we all uh, need to speak, share the ideas, uh, express our thoughts, our feelings, so it's actually topic for more than 500 billion of people, uh, inhabitants of European Union, but there is a big lack of discussions uh, in, in this area. Uh, and it's really uh, deeply linked with labor market. Uh, if you don't know the language of the country you want to live, it's your PD uh, and your problem. Uh, if uh, you learn, for example, now I know about the, such situation in Slovakia. Uh, there are the people from auto or car industry uh, and we are deeply linked with German-speaking countries because of Volkswagen, because of a lot of uh, uh, like economy issues, but nowadays all the students only learn English as a first and mostly or as the only one foreign language, uh, but we have Austria here uh, nearby, it's maybe three kilometers there or two <laughs> in this direction. We have a lot of companies, they would accept uh, German-speaking uh, professionals in this area, but the students are ready, they have the profession, so they, knew, or they, they know the profession, and they know the English language, but in Vienna or in uh, Berlin or in Munich, uh, Munich uh, they need German-speaking uh, professions, uh, so uh, specialists about the, in, in, in car industry, for example. Uh, so this is uh, actually a really important uh, issue, so not only, let's say, for, for polyglots, but for like, ordinary people, uh, they learn one, maybe two languages. There's also a big question mark about the efficiency of the, of the learning of languages, of language learning uh, in the schools and in the, in the whole system, if we learn it uh, in, in, in a good way. And also a big uh, issue is the justice. So should we all use the language of the most important uh, empire or of the, of the biggest? Uh, country, uh, if it's okay and if it should stay in such way, because if you have European uh, uh, Union as a as a new, um, let's say, European empire, it's quite uh, interesting issue that it's the only one empire without a common language, and this is really good uh, uh, example of it. Of this is Euro. Uh, I hope you know about this something, but 
Euro is unique because of our languages, not about because of our language, because it's the only one uh, nodes or only one uh, numismatic Unix. You have no texts on, on these banknotes. If you will see uh, any banknotes of the world, I have several here, you can see it after dollars, Austrian dollars, foreigns, and so on. Everywhere you will find some texts on the banknotes, but not on euro because of languages and language problems. It's quite interesting issue. Uh, big question also about the European Union, maybe you know. The, the slogan of it is unity in diversity. But it is true. Do we have enough unity and, or maybe we have too much diversity and too little unity uh, in these areas, for example? Uh, we have lack of common language policy. We have uh, our educational systems are not so easy to, to compare. You learn something in one country, in another country, you have a totally other system of, of educational uh, uh, issues. Then also, it's really good, uh, um, visible now, the political decisions in one country, you have totally other opinions and, uh, as in the other, uh, which is of course good, but uh, if we want to create uh, this European power or empire, we should present ourselves as a uh, as, as one big uh, um, country or, or federation or, or whatever you call it uh, to be, let's say, a good partner to the others. Uh, the problematic issue, uh, please don't uh, mix unity with the so-called coca colonization. So I don't mean unity as a uh, mm, as something you should, uh, like, instead of having 24 languages and, and uh, cultures and, and, and songs and so on, uh, to have only one, uh, because this is what, what we have now with, with English in Europe. Uh, if you will switch any Slovak radio, you will hear in one hour maybe five English songs, maybe one Slovak and one Czech. And it's everywhere. It's not only the Slovak issue. I mean, uh, I've mm, had the, the same uh, mm, feeling in, in, in Poland, in, in Germany, and so on. Uh, so this coca colonization is quite dangerous topic. Uh, but these ideas are not so new, and not only mine. Uh, you can read some ideas about these topics from the chart of European identity from 95 and also from the text uh, uh, written by European houses in Austria, Italy and Germany uh, called Europe, in, Europe is Growing. So there was some recommendations what to do in the future. So for example, European cultural identity should be sought after and built in schools. But we still don't do this, uh, not in Slovakia, but probably also not in uh, other countries. Then, essential, uh, essential goal is to create a psychologically positively, uh, positive idea of the notion to be a European. We still don't do this. Uh, Europe needs a culture and educational politics which will create European identity. Do we have something like that? Brexit has shown us that probably not and we still have the, the risk of next Brexits in, in other countries. Uh, cultural and educational politics that will contribute to the growth of the European identity and also bring awareness about equality within the diversity must be carried out. Good uh, recommendations, but the reality is far from this. Uh, the big problem is also that we have no clear political decisions concerning languages. So there are only some or just some principal guidelines, example this, that education must be organized in such a way that every school system will allow integration by taking into account mother tongue of the native, uh, native population, but also mother tongue of the children. A chance to learn at least one foreign language must be provided to all the pupils. 
Ability to communicate in mother tongue, but also in other languages must be developed. Communication must be improved uh, in order to make possible for children to learn foreign languages as early as possible. And multilingualism must be encouraged. But what about the last sentence? Do we do something about this or, or the, the ministries of education in, in uh, our countries, the Europe as a whole? Let's discuss about this after. Now maybe a little bit more provocative question. What do you think about this idea? <coughs> Sorry. I would recommend you uh, at least to read something from uh, Robert Philipson. Uh, these are his two books, Only English Europe and Linguistic Imperialism. But uh, he explains a lot about the so-called linguistic imperialism and the language hegemony and language uh, democracy and so on. And uh, not only this, but he gives uh, uh, concrete examples of this. He worked before in British Council, now he is a professor in, in uh, Denmark in, uh, in a university. And he also gives the examples that, for example, too much English means too little of all the other languages. And this also has shown by European Commission in several papers. If you are interested, I can send you some documents about this because there was some uh, surveys that all the countries where English was like on the top, uh, the people speak this language uh, uh, like on a, a daily basis. All these countries, all other languages uh, was uh, on uh, so, let's say, small or uh, the, the grow was uh, so uh, was getting down. Uh, and it is not only about the small languages, but the German, the French, and, and Spanish, and so on. So all these countries, like uh, Netherlands, Norway, Sweden, they are really good, like bilingual, so they speak English perfectly, but they almost now nobody already speaks some third language or, or third, fourth, and so on. And this uh, is also an issue about the costs of English learning. I don't know if you are aware about the uh, documents or, or the, the work of uh, François Gran, the, uh, um, from, uh, from Switzerland. Uh, he's a professor which uh, he makes like, uh, um, he clarifies and, and he makes uh, researches about the cost of multilingualism and how much does it cost for, for the inhabitants to learn languages and so on, but not only for the people, but also for the ministries, for, for, the, uh, for the state as a whole. And he explained, uh, for example, that uh, we as uh, countries of European Union, we pay approximately 17 billions of euro each year uh, to the British economy actually, uh, only because of English learning. Uh, so the English is uh, naturally the, let's say, the hegemony of empire, but also it means the hegemony of language. Uh, till now, if you see the history, Persian, uh, the, the Latin, uh, in our area here, 40 years ago, the Russian language, 120 years ago, or even 100 years ago, uh, German and, and Hungarian, so we always speak the language of, of the empire, of the biggest one, of the most powerful one. But what about the European Union? Which language should we choose to speak in European Union? Uh, we, even now, after the Brexit, it's even uh, mo uh, most in, uh, a more interesting uh, issue. So which language should be the language of, of, this, imp uh, of this empire? Uh, as it's a little bit strange to use the language of, let's say, uh, the, the first country who decided to leave us. Then, uh, so it's uh, profoundly linked. Uh, I would recommend if you, uh, if you are interested, uh, there is a one book of Zlatko Tischler, is a uh, 
Croatian uh, uh, writer. He uh, wrote the book called First European uh, Ideology, but then it was the, the, the new version was called European Identity. And uh, so his idea was, or his, his wish was that uh, the European Union would be the seat of the unif unification of the entire human race. Uh, so I would recommend you uh, uh, to read this because he gives uh, several explanations about this identity issue linked with the language. And he, for example, argued that uh, it is easy to deduce that behind the principally uh, declared rule by which all languages are equal, there is a political force which is secretly striving to make English the language of Europe. This was written 20 years ago. Now, obvious, actually it almost became true. <laughs> Uh, but now, after the Brexit, it's again, we have a big question mark, what, what now? So we have several solutions, in my opinion. Uh, so we could accept the current status, the unofficial domination of English. We also uh, can make English official common European Union language. We could create brand new language, European language. We, sh we could accept Esperanto as a uh, European language or the uh, language uh, to, to share the ideas in, like in on a neutral uh, area, or we could create some new other solution. So these are my ideas or my uh, points about the issue of European identity and uh, identity linked with the language. Uh, so, what uh, do you think about this? Uh, this is like, from my point of view, uh, uh, I just wanted to give you some ideas to, to think about, even after uh, you will come back from a polyglot gathering. But maybe we could also speak about these possible solutions. Maybe you have uh, a brand new one or, or the other uh, ideas uh, we can propose to the European Union and to the uh, politicians there. So I would like to ask you, what do you think about these issues? Do you have some, something to add? Hi, does this work? Yeah. I'd like to restate uh, actually the, some, an idea I was talking about uh, with the two gentlemen here uh, about an hour ago, uh, which is uh, some combination of these solutions. Uh, my, it's an idea I've had uh, a while ago to uh, accept a, a neutral language, so it could be Esperanto, I speak Esperanto, but in theory it could be any other neutral language, as an additional language. You just don't change anything else. You just accept it as, a, as an additional working language uh, that people can use, free to use it, free to not use it, and uh, because right now they don't have they don't have the option to use it. So by giving, by showing that it's possible, just giving the possibility uh, to to use it, you create a sort of uh, a window for uh, other people to see that okay, you know, some other form of uh, of communication uh, is um, is possible. And at the simplest, you can even reduce this. Uh, this solution to the two lingua franca solution, that, that, that's what I call it, is that you say, okay, English is the current major lingua franca, we'll accept that, but we'll introduce an alternative. That alternative cannot be a national language, it has to be something that has a, a tweak that has, that's better than English in some ways. And of course, uh, a neutral language that's, that doesn't belong to any of the member states uh, is that. And then uh, you can make, even if people don't speak Esperanto, you, they, they can, interpretation becomes extremely simple because it's two-way. Two-way, even three-way, four-way is extremely simple to manage. Uh, it's just the 24 official languages, that's what's impossible to manage. So, uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's basically uh, the idea that, that I have, and I compare it uh, to Linux versus Windows, you know? It's just Windows is the dominant, Linux hasn't replaced it, but if you don't want Windows, you can use Linux, and you can use it to do more and more things nowadays, and it has its own advantages, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's more accessible, it's free, and so on. So that's it. Thank you for the ideas, maybe just a further second. Uh, how would you make this, uh, like, to have 
two languages, let's say, uh, or to add Esperanto or whatever nearby. Because I have the feeling that it would be really problematic issue because of the economy and because of the power of English, for example, now. I think uh, I would beginning, first of all, I, I, think, I think of this as an uh, open-ended process, like uh, uh, it wouldn't be like, okay, we're going to make this, we're going to make Esperanto the big language, just give the option, that's the first thing. So people, I think it wouldn't have, it would be a minority language first, but if you're someone who thinks that uh, there shouldn't be uh, you know, linguistic imperialism, or you know, to use another word, uh, you know, a, a hugely dominant uh, national language, then you have another option. So even if it's, uh, I don't know, five, ten percent of, uh, you know, uh, an, an assembly of, uh, could be the European Parliament, for instance, since it's the, uh, the typical example with, you know, 24 official languages being theoretically uh, equal and, and, and usable, um, the, uh, the, the fact that uh, you can show your, uh, I was going to say refusal, but uh, you know, that you can show that you can you can do something better, uh, and that you have the right to, and that you know, since that would include uh, interpretation to one or a few other languages, or people would still understand you. They wouldn't be the, the onus wouldn't be on them to learn the language. Uh, then, uh, then, then that then it would be possible in practice, and even if uh, still a minority practice, uh, I believe the fact that, you know, because right now there's no official status whatsoever, the fact that it would, that an official status would exist would encourage probably more and more people to, to learn. Even if it maybe would stagnate, maybe it would stagnate 10, 20, 30 percent, but it would be, I imagine, well, in, in, in my opinion, better than the current situation. I've spoken too much, so. <laughs> Well, I don't think that any of these solutions is a very realistic one. Uh, I was uh, dealing with the language policy in the European Commission and I wondered always why the Barcelona principle failed completely. And I read a lot of big books about that. You all know Barcelona decision of 2002, a mother tongue plus two languages should be the aim. So it doesn't work. Uh, the uh, people learn English and uh, perhaps uh, for hobby uh, some other languages uh, which don't uh, actually heighten the possibility because if a, a Greek uh, learns Irish on, and uh, Portuguese learns Swedish it does, they don't come together uh, so actually it will be always English uh, the common language uh, my idea would be for example to strengthen uh, much more uh, the learning of neighboring countries. Uh, so it's especially, here we are, we are here in middle Europa. You, you told, uh, well, three kilometers away is Vienna, uh, or the border of Austria, uh, but the people don't learn German. And uh, uh, you should uh, start in the kindergarten. There are marvelous uh, initiatives uh, everywhere, uh, but the uh, politic, policy, uh, politics doesn't uh, support them. They, uh, they, they learn, the ch children in Eastern Germany learn Polish in the kindergarten or Czech in the kindergarten. They have no prejudices. That's as worthless language as uh, many adults would have, perhaps. Uh, and they learn it and then um, these border regions, they will form Europe. And these were always the regions where the conflicts break out, where the minorities live. And, and these uh, um, people of the border regions could be ambassadors to tell their uh, compatriots uh, how is the life in, uh, how is politics in the neighboring country and so on. So, uh, it, and you see, for example, in the moment, the crisis raises more interest in policy, politics in other countries because um, uh, uh, some 20 years ago nobody in Germany knew how the uh, Greek minister president was named. Now we know even the name of the finance minister, for example. And these uh, things, uh, the, these perhaps will create a European, more European uh, public, but uh, we should uh, make uh, these Barcelona policy much more concrete and I think uh, the right way would be learning of the neighboring countries. I agree, 
but actually in this case, uh, you have explained the first status will stay in, so, as, as it is now. Okay. At first, I want to tell you that there is one country which no common official language, which is quite economically successful. It's Switzerland. So also, they have a domination of the German. They don't have an official common language. And the second is, even Juncker said, after Brexit, the importance of English will decrease and also our law system in the European Union does not work with English only. And I'm not sure if we need a common language. Um, we also can may um, uh, emphasize on understanding each other. For example, in the lecture I listened before, I heard a Norwegian can understand of 70% of Swedish without learning. In the similar example is Spanish Italian. That we focus more on these abilities. And for example, two big world languages, Arabic or Chinese, their dialects, or I listened today in the morning, they are called topolects, uh, as different as Portuguese and Romanian. Just a small remark that uh, in Switzerland wouldn't be so easy probably with 24 languages. With four, it's maybe possible to manage it. First of all, uh, many thanks for a very interesting talk, uh, Peter. Um, just a few brief comments. Uh, you mentioned the cocoa colonization. I think it's a, it's a good expression. Uh, because uh, for many years I used to watch the Eurovision Song Contest when there was a rule that everybody sang in the, the national language of their own country. But they relaxed this rule and, and people were allowed to sing in English. And the whole contest deteriorated from being a real international contest to being a kind of provincial Anglophone conference. Uh, so I mean, I, I stopped watching it basically at that stage. And uh, it, it's uh, the rule, of course, the, the change was very seductive because it, it seemed like let's allow more freedom, we'll, we'll remove the rule for uh, you have to sing in your own national language. And uh, uh, initially this looked like a very good idea because it gave more freedom, but the, the result is uh, more uniformity and, and, and less uh, diversity. I, 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 when I think of this, I think it's like a, a lion uh, proposing that the, at the zoo, let's get rid of all the cages, let's give freedom to all the animals. But this basically means that, that the lion has, has the freedom to eat, to kill and eat all the other languages. But it sounds very good because, it, uh, and if you're against it, oh, you're against freedom. Uh, why are you against freedom? Let's remove the cages. But it's, it's very much the, the argument of the lion in favor, in, in the lion's own interest. Um, the, uh, Switzerland was mentioned. I think Switzerland had, when they took part in the Eurovision, they had a very in, enlightened policy because even though over 70% speak German in Switzerland, only 5% speak Italian, they had a song in German, a song in French, and then a song in Italian every third year. So they, they didn't uh, have domination because of a big majority speaking German, but they said that the 5% who speak Italian are entitled to have one of their songs every year. So th this, this problem in Eurovision could be solved easily enough. I mean, one would be to bring back the rule that you sing in your own national language. And a second rule I would like to see in introduced is that uh, if a song wins in one language, then you exclude that language for say, the next two years. So if a song wins in English this year, then say next year and the following year, we have no songs in English, but songs in any other language, then French, German, Spanish, Basque, Catalan, by all means, uh, to give uh, some idea of the variety of the languages in Europe. Uh, I do think we need a common language in Europe. There, there was a book by Professor Helmer Frank, uh, Europa's Sprachlosigkeit. And I think, uh, you, as you give the example of the Euro, it's a, it's a perfect example of this. There are all the different languages we have. 
we produce a coin, we produce a currency which has no language at all on it, just uh, bridges. And so, if somebody in a future generation looks at our euro uh, notes, they will say, yes, they, they did a lot of good architecture in Europe, but it seems they never spoke at all. They had no language in those days because they, they didn't speak. Um, you also mentioned Zamenhof's idea that the your, your, uh, um, unification of Europe should be the first step towards the un unity of the human race. I think this is a, a very good idea, and we we've often forget that Zamenhof is associated just with the language, with Esperanto, but we forget that the Esperanto was just a, a, an instrument, uh, and his ultimate goal was peace, world peace, uh, humanity living, living together, and, and certainly it seems to me that Euro European unity is one step towards, towards this. It, it, it's, it's not... But, and the final point, I think, is I really do think that Europe does need a common language, but it has to be a neutral language. If it's English or French or whatever, it gives an advantage to one part of Europe over everybody else. And even as an Irish person, as, as a native speaker of English, and we will now be just 1% in the EU after, after Brexit, I still think it would be completely wrong to give a, a, an unfair advantage just to my own country in this. Maybe I'm naive. I'm certainly many colleagues would, would describe me, see me as naive and being maybe even stupid. But I think injustice is injustice, wrong is wrong, and right is right, basically. I would like to comment. And uh, I like the idea of Nicholas uh, to try to add uh, an additional option, a neutral one, to the current status quo. Because we have three languages, now let's. Uh, think that this is the kind of transitional period because up to now there was no de debate on language policy issues uh, and now we have a chance to raise these issues within the ongoing discussion on future of European Union. Yes, and uh, I would uh, tell you one, uh, two examples. We organized in Slovakia in 2006 a language policy conference on perspective of uh, language policy and language rights in the European Union in 2006 and uh, also last year in Nitra within the uh, Slovak presidency in the, in the Council of uh, European Union and uh, we had extremely serious problems how to provide a fair interpretation. Interpretation costs us very high and we had to decide uh, what languages would be the working languages of these two conferences. And for the first time, we had to save costs, yes? And we proposed, and it was the fact, we had three working languages, Slovak, English, and Esperanto. And we presented for the first time at the official conference conferences, uh, uh, this neutral option. And it was the kind of, yes, it is possible as an official full-fledged uh, uh, interpretation channel, yes? And uh, this way, and debating on these issues, we have to first object, provide objective information on Esperanto, that is uh, a solution for the future, but uh, we have to, wait five or ten years, yes, English will still be in the dominant position, but uh, this neutral option would be the solution. And to the Conrad, Conrad proposal, yes, it, is, it would be excellent to, to have and encourage citizens to study languages of neighbors. And it was an excellent proposal during the, the when was multilingualism really uh, Jan Figel and Leonard Orban, uh, they were two, two commissioners really re responding for uh, multilingualism, but it, it, is, it was a nice proposal, but in practice it is very difficult to convince uh, citizens to let's study, let's uh, uh, not to study big languages, dominant languages, but uh, languages of your neighbor for better communication, better understanding. Uh, vice versa, not only one way, yes, we will study your language, but vice versa, yes, it is uh, to building bridge to another culture, but uh, it should be from both sides. Thanks. Thank you for your attention. I hope you will discuss these ideas also in the future, maybe during this uh, gathering and uh, at, at home. 
Let me know if you have better solutions uh, as I've proposed. Uh, from my own experience and from my uh, life, I can, um, so I, I tried with several languages. I, I had uh, experience with uh, language policy and about communication in, in Europe and uh, also other countries. I don't know better uh, language for this solution as Esperanto because of the efficiency, uh, it's easy to learn, and the political neutrality. Uh, I'm not sure if it will uh, be the, uh, the response for, for these uh, issues, but at least for me uh, it was, uh, or it is actually, uh, the, the solution of, of the language uh, problems. Also, our organization uh, use, uh, uses Esperanto as a working language and it works much, much better uh, than to use English or other languages because we have people from all possible countries. Now we have people from Russia, Ukraine, Italy, France, Polish, Slovakia, and it could be actually strange to use English because not only because the, the, the problematic issues and the, comp, uh, the, the, the time consuming and so on, but uh, so uh, from my point of view, Esperanto would be a good solution, but I'm aware that it takes time. Uh, maybe the, uh, the, the polit policy now, the, the issues in, of Brexit, the, the policy of, of US uh, only helps to, to make the process uh, to, to be quicker. Uh, but um, maybe, as I think, we need brand new Europe, not only about the language policy, but uh, brand new Europe from the point of view of changing the minds, uh, changing the, the political system and uh, the financial system, uh, as it cannot survive next 50 years. So let's hope that the solutions will come. Maybe you could help uh, with them, uh, not only about the language issues, but also about uh, the, the other issues, economically, eco ecology, uh, and all other issues. So let's hope uh, of the better, uh, about the better world, but not only hope, but let's make the, the world better. So thank you for your attention, and let's have a coffee break. <laughs>